now moving forward in our in our presentation so right now we'll be discussing about sensory integrative disorder or sensory processing disorder so by definition Jinaya said that sensory processing disorder is a neurological disorder that results from the brain inability to process certain sensory information received by the body sensory system. So, and if you can look at this definition critically, we see that there is a disconnection between this body whole senses as well as the information that is being received. So if you match this with the definition that I defined in the first part, you can see that the body has its own sensation. The body sensation relies on the external sensation for more optimal functioning, for more productive work. But when there is an imbalance between these two, that means the information that is coming to the body senses is not well integrated or well processed or well accepted, well accommodated or well programmed or well used by the body home senses either in a right way or in a proposal or productive way it becomes an issue and when it becomes an issue it is being referred to professionally as a sensory processing or sensory integrative disorder so if you see the word sensory integrative disorder or sensory processing disorder they are nothing but to tell you that there is information coming into the body senses and this body senses is not utilizing it in a very accommodative or productive way and because of that there is an issue around the deficit or break that brings about deficit into the child's performance or behavior or way of life and that makes the child to be targeted a child with sensory integrative or sensory processing disorder so now the causes are very simple. It could be that there is a disconnection between the neural cells, or probably there is disconnection between the neural cells that tone or failure of the of a, of sensory messages to connect properly with the brain. The formation is getting into the body system, but for the body system to utilize it to process it by the brain and utilize it in an efficient way, that's not taking effect. The thought is that the sensory messages that have been received are inconsistent. I'm not getting enough feedback or I'm getting less input. And by the time you start talking about sensory integration approach or therapy, you get to understand this. That talks about the duration of intervention, the intensity, the protocol, the schedules and everything. If this is not properly determined, that the child is not getting enough input as required by his body need, intensive processing disorder will still be surface. So that is that. Now, the next point that we'll be talking about is sensory processing disorder has classification. And by theoretical view, they are starting classification around it. And that is what we use mostly when it comes in terms of diagnosis. Like the child is, is under this category of sensory need, it's under this of it's under that of sensory need. Majorly, there are three essential the sensory processing disorder or sensory integrative disorder is classified into three major headings. And the number one is that the child could have what is known as sensory modulation disorder. The second point is that the child could have what is known as sensory based motor disorder. Again, sensory based motor disorder. The third is that the child could have sensory disintegration disorder. So, the SMD is a sensory modulation disorder, the SBMD sensory based motor disorder, and the SDD sensory discrimination disorder. All have different views. They have their presentation, they have their clinical symptoms that can make us to say that this child is under this class category. So moving forward from that, I will take SMD, SBMD and SDD in a single folder so that I can dissect it in a very understandable way and from that we we'll move on to the management. So now if we are talking in terms of sensory modulation disorder is the ability of the child or the ability or the capability 
of the child to withstand a sensory stimuli or sensory stimulation that is coming from the external view and to use it in an efficient way that will enhance its functional performance and maintain it at the optimal functional level. Which means that if, for instance, the child is in school and this child required a tactile sensation, and in that case, if I recommend as a therapist, if I recommend a weighted vest or a lap weight, and I put a lap weight on him or a weighted vest on his on his body along with the stretch, and the child is able to sit down in class and he should be able to follow instruction, able to calm down while writing and do details or all his work. That means that the modulation is taking effect through the concept of SI using body vest as a what as a tool to achieve that greatness. So if this can be enhanced, this is the concept behind sensory modulation, the ability of the brain, or the capacity of the brain to withstand the information that is coming, process it in an efficient way, able to use it in a productive and making a functional return, and the child should be able to maintain it. That's what sensory modulation talks about. Now, when it comes in terms of classification, we have three different levels of sensory modulation disorder. Number one is that a child can be sensory over responsivity or over response. So, which means that a child might be, might have more than enough sensory input within their system at this given as a starting time. And that will make them not to function at optimal level. Example is a child that is having auditory over responsibility. If the child had even a drop of water or a sound from musical area, it's going to block his hair. And if that happens, that makes the child not to function effectively. Considering if the child is in the mosque or his church or in the gathering or in a party or a better party or where for some function, definitely the child will not be able to enjoy himself due to the over-responsivity of the sound that is coming to the air. Another one is that the child is over-responsive to tactile stimulation. If you touch, come on auntie, you feel irritated. The child will not want a hug. The child will definitely run even from common touch, which is not supposed to be. And such a child again, if it's proposafty based, the child will walk in an awkward, upright posture because he will definitely be very careful of lifting the body due to the overall sensational return that is happening within the joint. So the other end there is that we have sensory under-responsivity, which means that the child is sensory under-responsivity. The child will crave for it. We always want more input in order for them to get balance. Such a child might jump rigorously on trampoline. Such a child might jump on your bed. Such a child can jump on chairs in school. Such a child will jump anywhere. Once they see their venue, the opportunity on chair, on bed, or anywhere, they keep jumping. Because the more they jump, the more they get input into their proprioceptive sense. Also, this child can stunt anyhow he wants on trampoline, honey swing. Even when you lift this child up in form of a plate, they turn, they spin. Because of what? Because of the fact that they need more input. If it has to do with vestibular, they keep enjoying all items in a more rigorous way that might be serving you sometimes because of their need, because of their want. So that's one side. Another part is if a child, a child can be sensory seeking or sensory demanding. So if they are sensory seeking in terms of modulation, they are more towards danger and need to be very, very, we need to be very careful of, even in terms of management, because the way they utilize materials, it's in a very dangerous way. They want it. Once they see the avenue or the platform to explore, they explore with all form of materials in a very damaging and self-injurious way. Because of the sensory craving. So if they see a swing, they can complete 360 rotation on a swing if care is not taken. And those that might even be limited to do some certain productive work. Because whenever you are getting them along, they keep this they are highly distracted, even if it is visual, if it is auditory. Once they hear the sound, they want to know where it's coming from. If they hear, if they see something, they want to get into the root. So with all this, they are more prone to distraction, they are more prone to injury, they are more prone to so many damage. Even they can damage so many materials within the house, 
within the school, within the therapy center. So we need to be very, very careful of that. <clears throat> Moving forward, we have sensory-based motor problem. Under that, there are two essential things that I want us to take note of as dyspraxia, and the other one is postural disability or postural disorder. The dyspraxia I mean, talks in terms of when there is a childhood, I mean, it's a childhood based condition when the brain is unable to accommodate or to enhance movement and coordination activities. So it has to do with coordination, it has to do with movement, and it has to do with childhood, and it has to do with the brain not able to function along the continuum of this. So when a child has issue relating to writing, issue relating to being settled down, related, relating to being coordinated on tasks, being coordinated in walking pattern, being coordinated in sequence of tasks and the likes, they are based on motor tasks. So a child that cannot visualize, visually track an object, a child that cannot integrate or write on a straight line along the continuum of SI practice, it's under sensory based motor disorder. The other hand is um, what you know as postural disability or postural disorder. Postural disorder talks in terms of how the body mechanism functions along with senses. So it means that if my I'm getting an input, a tactile input and proprioceptive input as well as vestibular input, I should be able to walk on a straight line, on a platform, on a hedge. I should be able to climb a stair. I should be able to jump. I should be able to, fall, to climb a jungle gym and the like. But when all these are not well integrated, when there's an issue with this, it becomes a postural related issue. When a child is not able to, to climb or cross an obstacle with these two due to sensory based problem, or when a child is afraid of height, or when a child cannot jump, or when a child cannot even climb a step, probably due to unwanted um, sensory needs and the like. So we have two major issues around that. Number one, under postural disorder is that we have what is known as gravitational insecurity and the second is that we have postural insecurity when we say gravitational insecurity it means that the child will have deficit in carrying out any activity that has to do with gravity climbing a staircase it's gravity based climbing an obstacle is gravity based walking through a slope area is gravity based. So if a child is unable to attain this or attempt all this, they are towards gravity or gravitational insecurity. They have fear of falling. They have fear of getting injured. And that tells you that when they lift up one leg in order to cross an obstacle to him at a target, such a child has in his mind that I am going to fall or I am not secure. Something is not going to be balanced. So this child can be worked with with a diversional therapy and a focused sensory base, whereby the sensory, the sensory system will be programmed along with intervention, and intervention will be more to motor base, which means that movement, movement, movement has to be encouraged along with the intervention. Though you are working on sensory integrative approach, but it has to function along with motor planning. So that the child can get out of the mood of not feeling secured. When it is postural insecurity, that child is more to height, which makes it different from gravitational. So when you said height, if a child managed to be on the platform, for instance, a child that has issue with postural insecurity will never stand on a platform swing, on any swing, once he climbs it, he wants to sit down on the platform. If he sits, sit down, he knows that he will have a wider base of support. But while you're sitting, you have the buttocks, you have your leg, so you can move forward and back we can't fall in. So they have more wider base of support and they are ready to do anything while sitting. Feeling more comfortable in sitting or lying down than while standing due to the posture because posture has to do with the whole entire body mechanism and that has to do with vestibular spinal reflex which is actually different from vestibular ocular reflex that I explained in the vestibular system the, um, the first part so we need to understand this 
So that means we have two systems. We have the vestibular ocular that works with the vestibular and the high, and we have vestibular spinal that works with the spinal cord, and which supplies um, nerves that function along the muscles of the body and that get our body well set to well balance biomechanically. So that is not the point of discussion. But I wanted to know that it works with the system of the reflex that is known as vestibulo spinal reflex. Now, if a child demonstrates either of these two, there is an the intervention has to be motor based and through exposure therapy, which means that gradually we have to increase the duration, we have to expose them to it, we have to get them onto it, we have to fade it when adaptive response takes effect. Now, moving to the third one, which is sensory discriminative or discrimination disorder. This has to do with all the senses, especially all the distal senses. When I said distal senses, you remember your visual sense, your auditory sense, your, um, your olfactory sense, your gustatory sense, as well as the proximal sense, the vestibular, the tactile, and then the proprioception. All these function along that continuum, as well as the autonomic reflex. Also, so the autonomic 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 reflex function for um, hunger, thirsty. I want to drink water. I need. Um, I want to void. I want to urinate and all that. So that means your bladder, your stomach, the, um, the stomach, the bladder, as well as the intestine to some extent. To some extent. So all this works along with the reflex. I mean with with sensory discriminative or discrimination disorder. It can affect any of these organs and based on that, they have been classified into these various diagnoses. So if you met an, uh, an occupational therapist or whoever it is and they are giving a diagnosis along gene high SI practice, they will most probably focus on all this classification, this three edit, and they have to narrow it down to one or to whichever one that it is. Sometimes a child might have one key diagnosis like SMD over responsive to so -so, so so sensation and then it might rule out some other sensation sensory based or like sensory motor sensory based motor disorder or what, whatever you so depending on the therapy that is giving the diagnosis and based on that their intervention has to be enhanced. So this is what happened in terms of gross view of sensory integrated disorder. Moving forward, we are going to be talking about what are the tools that are available for an occupational therapist to assess a patient and come out with the findings that has to do with all this. So there are various tools in the market, there are several of it. But well, for the purpose of this presentation, I want to make it. I want to limit it to the one or three of the common use tools or assessment skills that can guide the assessment of this particular situation. So the three are available. They, they are commercially based. You can find them at. Um, you can find them online. You can get them through other agency and the like. So I'm going to be talking about just three or four out of all, and based on that. Uh, move on to our intervention. Moving forward, talking about occupational therapies and assessment skills available to evaluate a child with sensory processing disorder. Occupational therapies will assess the child's sensory profile using observation. We can use interviews sometimes. Sometimes we use play and sometimes we use standardized assessment tools or skills. Now, either play, interview, or um, observational techniques. All these are just to find, to screen the child. But when it comes to finding out the deficit and pronouncing a diagnosis, there's always a need for a standardized measure as an occupational therapist practice, practitioner. So now, I'm going to discuss three different or commonly used assessment skills to find out sensory based or sensory processing deficit in the child. The number one I'm going to be discussing is sensory integration and praxis test. That is first. Then I will talk about sensory modulation, oh sorry, sensory processing measure. And the third um, I will discuss about sensory or short sensory profile. So all these three skills are commercially available. They are very very relevant 
and they have a good validation when it comes to finding out problems that has to do with sensory processing deficit. So moving forward, sensory integration and praxis test is a skills that is used to evaluate sensory processing. It is regarded as the gold standard, again, as the gold standard for determining sensory processing deficit in a child of any population. So which, when I say gold standard, meaning that is the most relevant, it's most validated, and it has more reliability than others. So which means, if you rely on intervention or your assessment on sensory, excuse me, sensory integration and practice test, it gives you a gross view of the problem around the child as related to sensation and pinpoint the diagnosis. It's, the age limit is between four years to eight years. So when a child is less than four years, it's not usually ideal. Because there are some skills in terms of development that the child is not expected to be achieved, which need to be tested by this scale. And when a child is eight years, it has gone above the requirement or the required age limit to be tested on this scale. Between two to two and a half hours plus, you should be able to complete it in the standard wise. And these skills, test so many areas. It tests free visual perception, tests motor planning or praxis, sensory motor processing, even somato sensory processing. That means the motor as well as the sensation, these things, these skills, check that as well. So it's a very relevant skill as I said. It is why it's most commonly used in terms of normal gene high sensory integrative approach practice not others for others people use variety of skills but in terms of standard si practice the gold standard scale that is well recommended is this sensory integration and practice test the scale i'm going to be discussing about is sensory processing measure the sensory processing measure provide a complete picture of child sensory functioning at home at school and within the community. It also assesses sensory processing, assesses praxis and social participation of a child. The scale in its normal package comes with three different forms. The first form has to do with the home environment. The second form has to do with classroom or main classroom environment and the third one talks about the school's environment. The age limit to practice this is between 5 to 12 years, which means that it expands more scope. The, the first one that the sensory integration practice test is between 3 to 8, but this has gone beyond that. Start with from 5 years to 12. So if a child is not doing well on or has cut across, the, I mean the age has cut across using um, sensory integrative practice test, we can as well recommend sensory processing measure, which is very relevant and validated tools as well. It's expensive, but it's a very reliable scale. So from that, we'll be talking about the thoughts. Now, this is the short sensory profile. is the most commonly available skill. We can see it, and even we can get it online. It's very much available anywhere. We can get it also, the, the complete pack, it's always available on Amazon. So it was designed as a screening tool for children who exhibit any difficulty in any of the daily life performance. The scale has to be completed by the parent, which makes it to be a questionnaire based. So the parent has to complete it, and after the completion, it has to be interpreted and scored by an occupational therapist. So who recommended it or who is giving it to the parent? So after giving it out, then the parent can fill it out. So if the parent is not educated enough, because the scale is coming in English and it has been validated in so many languages, in too many contexts, based on the need. But as far as I know, of some certain countries like Nigeria and uh, India has the validated ones of um, SSP that has to do with India context. But as far as Africa is concerned, I'm not so sure about South Africa, but I'm still trying to source on that or get more information regarding that. But in Nigeria, it has yet to be validated to any of the Nigerian context language. So I believe that maybe as time goes on, we'll work on that. All of us as therapists, we have to work on that. So if it comes in English and the parent 
are not getting that. So that means the therapists have to accompany or somebody that understands the child as well as the family needs to step in and assist in this particular fill it so they have to fill it out by the parent and if you want to make it more objective it means that the person that's going to fill it needs to understand the child need to be very close to the child so a caregiver or a parent or a relative that is very bound with them so that knows the child in depth then the interpretation has to be done by the occupational therapist so as you see that i said that it's a screening tool meaning that the interpretation does not diagnose or give a diagnosis of its spe of a special condition around the child. You can only target that okay, this child is exhibiting this and this might be this. Grossly, you have the view that the child might be having this, but the most reliable in terms of diagnosis and the validated done, I that I go with SPM that sensory um, the, the, the SPM or you go with the um, sensory integration and practice test skills. So the age range to apply SSP is just between three to ten years. It's very vast, so it goes across age and it assesses sensory processing aspect of the child. It assesses also sensory modulation. Is that over responsive, under responsive, or seeking? It checked it in depth and the sensory processing as well as the sensory modulation aspect of the assessment can be done at home or at school setting. So with this, I've completed the three aspects of the skills and with this, I hope uh, to guide our practice as an occupational therapist and for parents who are listening, these are very re relevant and very necessary. So sometimes when you meet with the therapist, you need to put them to a challenge, let them lift up to the task. Because when your child is not properly diagnosed or when it's not properly analyzed, the intervention you expect should not be appropriate. Because when you don't know or when you don't have a very visible problem around the child, we'll just be treated grossly. So what are we treating? I don't know. You don't know. Because we don't have a very directional way. But when you have a, a, a proper diagnosis, it gives a very sense of intervention that you'll be practicing. And when other therapists see the intervention, we can presumably say that this child is having this issue. So, and that is why they are using this particular form of SI approach to combat it. So it's very, very required. So the intervention does not start from the intervention point. It starts from the assessment view. So when the assessment is right, the intervention is most probably going to be right. And when the intervention assessment goes together or hand in hand, it makes the progress to be well easy to track. So I can say that before my child is at this level, in terms of sensory seeking, in terms of sensory wanting, in terms of uh, sensory over or under responsive, but now it has gone up to this improvement that the child is up to this. So you can track the progress as time goes on with the therapy, even without the therapy's analysis. So that is that about the scale. So moving forward, we'll be talking now in the third session about sensory integration as an approach to intervention to manage a sensory-based or sensory integrative disorder.